Nestle's Quick for the greatest tasting chocolate milk. And those famous Nestle's chocolate bars present Space Patrol! <laughs> High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! <laughs> In today's transcribed Space Patrol adventure, Buzz and Happy are aboard the Terra 5, preparing to fight off an attacking robot ship. Fire stern torpedo one. Fire one. Surely you don't think I'm aboard this robot ship, Commander? In a few seconds, Polidor, there won't be a ship. Commander, the torpedo exploded short of the target. The ship's protected by a force field. Our torpedoes explode when they hit the field. That's right. Keep firing if you like. You can't stop this robot ship. It's gaining on us, sir. If you don't act quickly, it'll ram us and blow us to bits. We'll return in just a moment with today's exciting Space Patrol adventure, Race Against Time. Come and get it! Come and get the coolest, most refreshing, most delicious glass of chocolate milk ever. Space Patrollers, that's Nestle's Quick. There's nothing in this universe that tastes so good, mixes so fast, and cools so well. Nestle's Quick has the same terrific flavor as your favorite Nestle's chocolate bars. What smooth, velvety chocolate. And it's so easy, Quick just about makes itself. Listen, first you pour out your big, frosty glass of milk, then you just drop in two teaspoons of Nestle's Quick. Swish it around for a second, and there it is, your Quick Me Up. Packed with nourishment, full to the brim with cool refreshment. Just what you want in this hot weather. So be sure you get Mom to bring home the big brown and yellow can of Nestle's Quick. So you can make yourself a glass of Quick anytime you like. And remember, this is the sound of good things coming. Come and get it! Come and get your Martian totem head, too. Boy, you'd better hurry because this offer is almost over. You can have tons of fun with your totem head because it's got magic forehead vision. You can see out, but nobody can see in. They send the lid or a tracing of the label from a can of Nestle's Quick, together with your name, address, and 25 cents, to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri, and hurry! And now, today's Space Patrol adventure, Race Against Time. Commander Corey is waging a battle of wits against Polidor, the invisible mastermind behind a series of daring crimes. Although Buzz and Happy have captured several of Polidor's agents, the identity of the super criminal remains a mystery. Right now, the commander and Cadet Happy are in the office of Neil Channing, chief chemist of the Solfex Products Company in Lowell City on the planet Mars. Channing's staff has just completed a laboratory analysis of a complex mixture of chemicals provided him by the commander. Here you are, Commander. It's as complete and detailed as we can make. Oh, thanks, Johnny. I'll check it over now, if you want. Oh, go ahead. Well, you'll probably notice that in most of the items, our reports merely confirm the findings of your Space Patrol security lab experts. I'm sorry we weren't able to supply much new information. I don't expect miracles, Channing. At any rate, your independent tests cut down the margin of error. Oh, this paragraph on component 11. We've got data here that we don't know. Well, we should have. After all, it's a product we make here at Solfax. We intend to market it under the trade name Lumaplex. Lumaplex? It's a synthetic mineral with several unusual properties. For one thing, it amplifies light. Lumaplex? That's a new one on me. Channing, I believe you said you intend to put it on the market. Yes, it's still in the experimental state. Well, aren't you surprised that we should bring you a sample of it for analysis? No, not especially. It's our policy here at Solfex to let small independent researchers experiment with our new products. Why, we even have high school chemistry students on our trial and error shipping. It pays off, too. Some of our best commercial ideas have come from Andrew. Mr. Channing, did you ever hear of someone called Polidor? Polidor? Oh, you don't mean this long-range ventriloquist who's been throwing his voice all over the solar system? Yes. This sample of powdered chemicals is the remains of the gadget he uses to project his voice. He calls it a detectoscope. For the materials you've found in this sample, Channing, could you construct a device that would act as a spacophone and view scope combined? <laughs> Some order. And could you make it so compact that it's the size of a half-credit coin and only twice as thick? 
Definitely not. I don't say it's impossible, but it's beyond the scope of our know-how here at Soap. Well, it's not beyond Polidor's know-how. If we can find the man who put your Lumatrax to work, it might help us locate Polidor. To your knowledge, how many outsiders are working on Lumatrax? Well, at least ten individuals or firms. I, I can give you a list. Good. I'm not overlooking the possibility that someone here at Solfax might have found out more about Lumatrax than his told employer. It's not pleasant for I'm sure my employees are loyal, but I admit it's an angle you'll have to consider, Commander. Say, uh, maybe it's none of my business, but do you intend to question everybody on that list I mentioned? Our agents will. Why? Well, would it help you if you had a little background on these experimenters, the, the general direction of their research? You certainly would. Then Gannett's your man. Rudolf Gannett. Uh, he's an amateur astronomer, and he keeps in touch with a lot of the small fry experimenters, crackpots and all. Would an astronomer know much about electronics and its uh, lumaplex? Gannett might. Remember, I said he was an amateur astronomer. He was a research chemist before he retired. Now, he's got a nice place outside Lowell City where he putters around making his own telescopes and all the paraphernalia that goes with him. Even molds and grinds his own lenses. Every new plastic that comes out, he makes optical tests on. Mm, and he might be interested in work on lumaplex because of its light amplifying properties. Mm -hmm. Now, since we're here in Lowell City, we'll have a talk with him. Well, I'll tell you how to find his place. But I'm warning you, Commander. We'll be lucky if you can get Gannett's head out of the Milky Way long enough to talk to him. His mind is usually a million light years out in space. We'll take a chance. Thanks, Channing. Outward bound from Terra, a private cruiser follows a vector that avoids the regular space lanes. Its pilot, Chad Tessick, Keeps a wary eye on the viewscope screens and speaks into the space phone. Everything's set, Polidor, not a hitch. If you are sure you're not being followed, proceed to headquarters. I have another job for you. It involves Commander Corey. Corey? I thought Janik drew that detail. Yes, but unfortunately, an unforeseen move on Corey's part to Janikov's schedule. I want you to dispose of Corey before 1600 hours tomorrow. That's a pretty short notice, isn't it? Perhaps. But I want Cody out of the way when our device puts the Terra Communication Center out of commission. Maybe we can figure a way to have Corey at the center when our gadget doesn't work. Yes. It would give me great satisfaction for Cody to be on him when the entire nerve center of his precious space patrol is burned out. The Omicron radiation would finish Cory, just like it's going to take care of everybody in the communications building. Mm, it's a tempting part. But an attempt to maneuver Cody into the center at a second 1,600 hours might arise his suspicions and upset our plans. That shouldn't be hard. Corey's headquarters isn't far from communications. No, but Corey isn't on Terra. No, where is he? In Lowell City. It appears to me, Tessie, that Commander Corey's unhappy face will be among the important messages that the communication center will be unable to transmit. Hold it around. On a high hill some 60 miles from Lowell City is the home of Rudolph Gannett. It is not a spectacular residence. Its only unique feature being a small dome that unmistakably identifies it as an observatory. In a library adjoining the dome, Gannett looks up from a list of names Commander Corey has just handed him. I see you have Professor Arlington's name here. Do you know him? Oh, quite well. Uh, I don't wish to see him on time, but you might as well cross his name off the list. Then you don't think he's working with Lumaplex? Playing with Lumaplex is more in Arlington Grand, Commander. Please don't misunderstand me. Arlington is uh, competent in his field. A good instructor, but not an original research man. That's see. Uh, having just two names as being likely to experiment with Lumaplex along the lines I mentioned. James Hollister of Jupiter and Lawrence Earhart of Mercury City. Yes, Commander. Well, thank you for your help, Mr. Garner. Oh, you're not leaving. I was hoping to show you my observatory. And I'm sorry, but we've got to get back to Lowell City. Later, when we aren't so rushed, Happy and I would be delighted to see you. Oh, we sure would, Mr. Gannett. Oh, you men who search for criminals are always in the rush. That's my like astronomy. There are no criminals in the heavens. The stars all obey the law. And maybe that's because they're old enough to know they can't get away with disobeying the law. So long, Mr. Gannett. Goodbye, Mr. Gannett, and thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Goodbye, gentlemen. Tessie, are you there? Yes, sir. Coriander, can I just left? Keep out of sight. I took care of their surface car, Polidor. 
give them 10 minutes to start. Then take my car and trail them. This time we've got to make sure. With Commander Corey at the wheel, the Space Patrol surface car moves swiftly over the deserted road to Lowell City. The many turns and grades in this stretch through the mountains keep Buzz and Happy from noticing the car following a mile behind. Hey, we're making good time for this kind of road. Mm -hmm. What time is it? Well, I've got 11.16, but my watch is slow. What? Then Happy's watch isn't correct at a split second? Well, I noticed it at Gannett's place, sir. I checked it with his clock, and I'm a half a minute behind. Well, an astronomer would certainly have the correct time. I don't want to take my eyes off the road, Happy. What does my watch say? Why, uh, well, that's funny. Yours is the same as mine. We both can't be off the same amount. Well, yeah, right now, 30 seconds can't make any difference. That's right. We'll still make Lowell City by 1,200. Say, wouldn't it be a joke on Gannett, the well-ordered astronomer, if his clock was wrong? Mm-hmm. I just happened to think an observatory would have several clocks, keeping different kinds of time. Universal star time, local star time. Oh, sure. The clock I saw was probably on Mars sun time. Hey, Commander, our windshield is fogging up. Fog in this dry Martian atmosphere. Something is clouding the windshield. Uh, what's wrong with that automatic gizmo? But that electronic field is supposed to repel dust and Hap, vapor. I, I can't see. Look out the sight and guide me. Oh. Commander, you're too close to the edge. A little to the left. Hey, we're going over! We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. Hi, Space Patroller. Hi, Captain Kufeld. Hey, you see, you got another keen man from Mars totem head in the morning mail. How many you got now? Three and four more to come. Just wait. I'm going to have the biggest totem pole in the whole universe because I'm sending for totem heads just as fast as I can get box tops. Smart boy and Space Patrollers, if you haven't started your totem head collection, you better get going right now because this terrific offer ends soon. And you don't want to miss out on the fun you can have with these neat totem heads. Wear them over your head, and from head to shoulders, you're in disguise. A man from Mars totem head is more than 12 inches high, and every one of them has magic forehead vision. Yes, sir, magic forehead vision. That's the special secret eye plate. You can see out, but nobody else can see in. And when you get lots of totem heads, you can build yourself an honest-to-goodness totem pole in your room or in your backyard, like I'm doing. Each totem head has a face in front and one in back, too. A beak-like nose, fang-like teeth, and ears that flop. And wait till you see those bright Martian colors, red and yellow, green and black. Hurry, gang. Get your box top in your quarter and send for yours now. Remember, Space Patrollers, this offer soon ends. So for every totem head you want, send a rice checks or wheat checks box top, together with your name and address and 25 cents in coin, to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. Don't forget your 25 cents. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in the USA and may be withdrawn at any time. And now back to our Space Patrol adventure, Race Against Time. Buzz and Happy are in the surface car driving through a mountainous region of Mars after interviewing an amateur astronomer named Rudolph Gannett. Suddenly, the windshield of the car clouded up. And before Buzz could bring the car to a stop, it careened over the edge of an embankment. Now the car has tumbled to a stop in the soft dirt just a few feet from a straight drop-off. A moment later, another surface car rounds the bend and stops at the scene. A man gets out and ascends the slope toward the wreck. The two space patrollers lie motionless in a battered surface car. Then Happy moans and stirs. Suddenly, he's aware of a quick, firm grasp on his arm. A pressure that in one second tells Happy, even in his dazed condition... Buzz wants him to remain quiet and feign unconsciousness. An instant later, the car door is yanked open. Ah, but he need a job. Not quite need enough, Tessie. One of them is still alive. I heard him moan. Ah, they're both out cold. I can finish him off easy. Keep your hands off the car. We don't want fingerprints. Okay, poor I'll be careful. When you coated the windshield, you used two thinner solutions. It should have clouded up instantly, then I transferred the energizing field from the observatory. Well, it worked okay. The windshield is clear now. It looked like Corey lost control and tumbled over the cliff. No, if he hadn't had time to slow down, he'd have gone completely down to the bottom. Anyway, Corey wouldn't be able to stop our little surprise for the Ontario 1600. Well, look, why don't I drag him out and toss him over the ledge? It looked like they were thrown out of the car. It's an excellent suggestion. At first, 
dispose of the detective story. Can't you destroy it with the disintegrator impulse? Naturally. But you don't think I want space patrol investigators to find the powder in the car, do you? Yeah, that's right. They'd know the wreck wasn't an accident. Or find out that Janet and Paul it or are the same. Now, before you dispose of these two, throw the detectoscope over the lake. I'll disintegrate it in midair, and the powder will never be found. But remember, leave no clues. Be careful. Pull it around. Okay, pull it around. Here goes. Now, I'll take care of these two guys. Come on, Corey. You're going over the cliff. I'll take over from here, Tessie. Huh? Need some help, Commander? No. Except to carry Pessig up to his car. Wow. He got Polidor when he thought we were. Maybe. Give him a chance to fix us. No, sir. Now we know who Polidor is. Since he disintegrated the detective scope, he doesn't know we know him yet. You sure were right when you pegged Gannett as a phony. I'll notify Lowell City Headquarters and send a couple of patrol ships to Gannett Observatory. That is, if our car space is on That's dead. Maybe there's one in Pessig's car. And also a hidden detective scope. Whether we use the space phone or not, pull it all, be tipped off that we're still alive. I guess a surprise attack on his observatory is impossible. We'll take Tessig to Lowell City. Then we'll send patrol ships to the observatory while I work on Tessig. I've got to find out what pull it all meant by a surprise party on Terra at 1600. Yeah, I heard that. Hey, it sure can't be anything good. Remember, after we get near Tessig's car, not a word about pull it all, Tessig, or Terra. Maybe we can't keep him from seeing us with his detective scope, but we can keep him on a hot seat, worrying about what we're going to do. After a fast and silent trip to Lowell City, Buzz dispatches two patrol ships to Polidor's observatory. Then, in the space patrol headquarters of the Mars capital, he questions Chad Tessig. Once more, Tessig, what's Polidor planning to do on Terra at 1600? Polidor? Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. All right, then. Gannett. I heard the whole conversation back at the wreck. Polidor is Gannett, and you're working with him. You've been working too hard, Commander. You're imagining things. I'm through wasting time, Tessig. I'm giving you a brainograph test. Excuse me, Commander. Yes, Happy. The patrol just reported in from the observatory. Polidor was gone, I suppose. Yes, and so was that small atmosphere ship we saw parked near the house. The agents are searching the place from top to bottom looking for evidence. Get anything out of Tessig? No. The brainograph will fix that. Oh, another thing, sir. The local lab men went over to Tessig's car. They found some more powder. Polidor had a detectoscope in there, all right. Now get this, Tessig. If anything serious happens on Terra in the next few hours, we're going to hold you personally responsible. You can't do that. It's not fair. Huh. Look who's talking about fairness. Tessig, I know Polidor has planned the catastrophe for 1600 on Terra. You can help prevent it. If you don't, you'll take the consequences, and Polidor can't protect you. All right. It's a Terra communication center. It's going to be put out of commission. The whole works. Oh. How? 1600 hours, a surge of high-voltage current's going to be sent over the regular power lines. It'll burn out every bit of equipment in the place. Space phones, view scopes, computers, relay transmitters, recording equipment, everything. Well, how about the voltage regulators? They'll automatically break the circuits if there's an overload. Not with the higher frequency current we're using. It'll jump every fuse and relay you've got. That whole center will be burned out. It'll be completely useless. Where's this device planted? What part of the building? In power section four. It's well hidden where no one could find it unless they knew it was there. Tell me where it is and how to shut it off. I'll space phone instructions to tell. Well, it's not that easy. Polidor made sure it'd be a thorough job. It'll not only burn out all the equipment, but it'll take care of every living man in the building. How? Oh. Omicron radiation. When that charge hits every light in the building, whether it's turned on or off, will throw out deadly Omicron rays. Smoking rockets. You're going under the brainograph, Tessig. I'm going to find out how to shut off that machine. Yeah, you lick, Corey, because I don't know. You can bet that the men who installed it are scattered all over the solar system by now. Gee, Commander, what are we going to do? You can't do anything, Tessig. If that machine were right in front of you, could you figure out how to shut it off? So, but I'm on Mars and the machine's on Terra. That can be fixed. I'm taking you to Terra. But you can't make it by 1600. Good prime. Come on, Hap. Let's get him to the ship. With Tessig locked securely in an aft compartment, the Terra 5 roars toward Terra. For the tenth time in the past hour, Happy has recomputed their vector, weighing space against time in endless calculations. It's going to be close. It's going to be close. What do you figure now, Hap? What's our ETA? 15.50 and 25 seconds. Uh, less than 10 minutes to get from the spaceport to the communication center. And we don't know how much time Tessig will need to shut that thing off. We could take more acceleration, but I don't know about Tessig back there. We've got to keep him healthy and alert. When we drag him into communications, he'll be alert enough. He'll have to be to save his own skin. I'll increase acceleration a little. 
can cut down our travel time another five minutes. Hap, look at the rear view scope. A spaceship on our tail. And it's gaining on us. That looks like trouble. Pull the door. The acceleration must be terrific. It's probably under robot control. I'll challenge him and find out. Panacoria aboard Terra 5, calling spaceship. Now 5D user stern on our vector. Following Space Meridian 125. Request identification. Acknowledge. Have they stand by to fire space torpedo. Standing by, sir. He's still coming on. Corey aboard Terra 5 to unidentified cruiser. You're on a collision course with this ship. Unless you acknowledge and change vector, you'll be fired upon. Very well, Commander. Go ahead and fire. It's Polidor, all right. Polidor, we've changed vector and your ship is still telling us. I'm giving you one more chance. Come on target, sir. Fire stern torpedo one. Fire one. Surely you don't think I'm aboard this ship, Commander? In a few seconds, there won't be a ship. Commander, the torpedo exploded short of the target. Something must have been wrong with the proximity fuse. No, Cadet. This ship is protected by a force field. Your cosmic torpedoes will never reach me. Commander, should we try it again? It'll be a waste of time. The proximity fuses react to the force field instead of to the actual hull of the ship. That's right. Keep firing if you like. Meanwhile, this robot ship will pursue you and rem you. If we time it right, and wait till he gets real close... No, we destroy by our own torpedo. Exactly. You may as well face it, Tori. You will never reach Terra. And as you probably know by now, the communication center will be destroyed at 1,600 hours. In a moment, Commander, my use code screen will go blank. And I'll know that you and the Terra Pi have been blasted to bits. Goodbye, Commander. Gee, sir, what can we do? Evasive tactics are no good. Polidor's robot keeps right on our tail. Pat, put on a spacesuit, then shove a cosmic torpedo out of the cargo hatch. I'll cut down our acceleration. Well, yes, sir, but what good will that do? The torpedo will have the same velocity as the ship. It'll stay right with us. That's the idea. Hurry, get that suit on. When you're ready to shove the torpedo out, signal me on your suit's face phone. Now get going. Happy to Commander Corey. Go ahead, Hap. The hatch is open. Torpedo's ready. Have you disconnected the proximity fuse? Yes, sir. All right. We're going to cut our acceleration. Push the torpedo out, but take it easy. It'll explode on contact. Ah. It's clear of the ship, sir. But it's floating right along under us. Well, good. The robot ship is gaining fast. Brace yourself and keep clear of that hatch. I'm blasting ahead on all rockets. Okay, Commander. Everything all right back there, Hap? Yes, sir. But there was a big flash of light astern. That was Polidor's robot ship colliding with a torpedo. When I accelerated, we pulled ahead fast and left the torpedo behind. And the robot smacked it instead of us. Check on Tessie before you come forward. I want him in good shape when we reach Terra. It's 1548 by the ship's chronometer when the Terra 5 roars with the Terra space lock. Buzz and Happy are rushed to the communications building in the surface car, holding the panic-stricken Tessic between them. A swift elevator drops them down to power section four, where the infernal device is poised to hurl destructive current and deadly radiation through the huge building. Come on, Tessic. Where is it? It's in this room there behind that panel. Get to work and shut it off. And make it snappy. It's awful close to 1600. There it is. It's already started. We're too late. It's just building up potential. We won't throw the current into the main line until the power's up. Well, don't just stand there. Shut it off. Come on, I... I can't remember. I, I can't think straight. Let's get out of here. There isn't time to get out. The only way you can save your own neck is to save everybody else. Now, get to work. Hey, I think this is the switcher. Nothing happened. That must be for one of the preliminary operations. Once it's underway, it can't be stopped. I can't think. I can't think. I can't think if I turn the wrong switch, it would... Throw the power on ahead of time. Hessig, you've only got a few seconds. Quiet, Hap. Don't rattle him any more than he is. You might as well all relax, gentlemen. There is nothing you can do. Full of it. There's a detective scope in here, too. I don't suppose, Commander, you'd like to spend your final minute of existence in explaining how you avoided my robot ship. When the view scope went blank, I thought I had you. Think him shut up. Let me think. Now, how can Cody make me shut up when I'm safely on board? Full of it. Tell me how to stop this machine, please. He's not going to tell you. You've got to do it yourself, and you've got just ten seconds. Seconds? But, Commander... Eight, I... seven, six, five, four... I, I can't three, think. Two, one... Something's gone wrong. 
It's not going to go on. Those fools, those bungling fools. There's only one thing that could be wrong. They forgot to set the final locking switch. switch. The locking switch? Which one is that? Uh, this one, right here. But it's in position. That's all I wanted to know. <laughs> It's off. I don't understand. It was on before. Why didn't it work? Happy, what time do you have? Exactly 1600. Hey, my watch must be slow. Pull it off. You're still listening. What time do you have? 35 seconds past 1600. Right. By Mars local sun time. I was hoping you'd be too excited to remember there's 30 seconds difference. But, Commander, you were counting off the seconds. By Mars sun time. The machine was set by universal star time. Polidor thought his machine was out of order and obligingly told us how to fix it. Next time, Corey, you won't be so lucky. We'll meet again soon, Polidor. And I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, Polidor. And next time, we'll fix your clock. <laughs> In just a moment, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure brought to you by Rice Checks and Wheat Checks, the bite-sized cereals in the red and white checkerboard packages. <laughs> Say, gang, are you walking around without your head? Now, oh, Hap, how can anybody do that? Smoking rockets, Commander. I mean the totem head. That's the greatest thing since heads were first invented. Oh, I get it. And space patrollers, you want to get one of these spooky totem heads. You can see out, but nobody can see in. You've got to act right away. There's very little time left. And when this offer ends, it'll never be made again. Don't be without your head when it's so easy to get a totem head. You just send your name and address and 25 cents together with the lid from a can of Nestle's Quick or a tracing of the front of the quick label, or a rice checks, or we checks box top, to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. Got that, boys and girls? It's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. Now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy are trying to get out of a huge castle on the planet Venus, where Polidor is holding them prisoners. The two space patrollers are struggling, trying to open a heavy door. Oh, it's locked. But in a castle this size, there must be more doors. The chances are Polidor has them all locked. Yeah, by electronic control. Hey, Commander, something smells strange. I noticed it too. <laughs> My eyes are burning. Gotta find Polidor and take our chances. He's filling the castle with poison gas. Be sure to join us next week for the thrilling story... The Robot of Vorkana. Space Patrol, created by Mike Moser, starring Ed Cameras, Commander Corey, and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston. Produced and directed by Larry Robertson, executive producer Mike Devery. Other players were Bela Kovach, Ken Mayer, Norman Jolly, and Stephen Robertson. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday for exciting action. On Space Patrol! Space Patrol was brought to you today by Nestle's Quick for the greatest tasting chocolate milk and those famous Nestle's chocolate bars. Be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol program in your local ABC television station. Consult your newspaper for time and channel. This program is broadcast to our armed forces overseas through the worldwide facility...